Just over six years ago, my spouse, Wayne, was able to go with me to our Unitarian Universalist General Assembly for the first time. The General Assembly, or GA, is a once-a-year event where Unitarian Universalists from around the country and the world have our annual meeting. While at that GA, I purchased a small chalice. I wanted to have a chalice to light during my personal spiritual practices as a symbol to connect these individual practices with my larger Unitarian Universalist religious community. I couldn't have known that my little chalice would soon take on a different and much greater meaning in my life. For weeks before we had left for GA, Wayne had shared with me that he'd been experiencing a sense of foreboding, a seemingly irrational fear that something disturbing was about to unfold. On the Wednesday after we had gotten back from GA, I came home to find Wayne nearly in tears. That morning, he had turned on his cell phone to find the phone number of his good friend, Teresa, showing on the screen. We thought it was just an iPhone glitch, as neither one of them had called one another recently. Wayne and Teresa had gone to medical school together and have stayed great friends ever since. I had grown to know and love Teresa also, along with her two beautiful daughters, Tara and Jenna, whom we had first met when they were small children. In the warmth of Teresa's love, Jenna and Tara had grown into beautiful young women. They were both physically beautiful, but more importantly, they were loving, dynamic, smart, funny, talented, and they had this wonderful capacity to fill those around them with joy and laughter. Thinking that it was probably too early to call Teresa, Wayne nonetheless punched the number that had shown up on his cell phone. The voice that answered was one of agony, of the deepest sorrow and sense of lost purpose that human beings can endure. Teresa told Wayne about how Jenna had fallen and hit her head. She had died less than 24 hours later. She was 22 years old. In less than a moment, In a random flash, devoid of any apparent meaning, a beautiful part of our world, our interconnected web of existence was taken from our lives, from the lives of her family, from the lives of so many who loved her. As Wayne told me this, I stood frozen in disbelief and horror. It was as if the random, meaningless cruelty of it was ripping at everything I had come to believe, tearing into shreds my ability to feel any sacred beauty at all in the world. I was filled with sorrow for Teresa and Tara. I was devastated by the pain that I could see in Wayne's face and how the way he carries his body had actually changed. I didn't know what to do with this. I couldn't process it, couldn't understand it, couldn't fight back against the urge to rage against the arbitrary injustice of it. I had to sit down. I had to stare blankly at walls. I had to be with Wayne so that we could comfort and take care of each other. Later, after Wayne had gone to sleep, maybe the only refuge in such situations, I got out the little chalice I had bought at GA, and I lit it for Jenna. I sat alone in our living room, staring at the flame and thinking of her. The flame cast beautiful reflections of its light and enchanting dancing shadows on the stone wall behind it. And as I sat and watched the dancing light from the little chalice, I began to see in its beauty the loveliness that Jenna had brought into the world, a beauty that might still be there in some way, if only through our memories of her. It helped to think about things that way, but the thoughts were incomplete and not enough. At some point, I still had to extinguish the flame and go to bed, still filled with sorrow. Another day came and went with both Wayne and I sleepwalking through it, struggling to make sense of what had happened, to find some way to grasp at meaning when all meaning seemed to have been shattered and destroyed, if it had ever existed at all. Then on Friday morning, I got an email message from my great friend, Nell Newton. 
For me, one of the great mysteries in life is how sometimes we come to the aid of those that we love without even knowing that we're doing it. Nell had no way to know what was going on in our lives or how much that email would help. She was out of town and had sent the email for a different reason. And yet, there it was, sitting in my inbox, a ray of light and a renewal of hope from a friend in a faraway place just when it was needed most. The email had a link to a video of Senator Al Franken who had shown up as a surprise on the last day of that GA we were at and Wayne and I had missed it because we had to leave early to catch our flight. In part of his speech, Senator Franklin spoke lovingly of his father, of how his father thought that nature and the earth and everything are so beautiful that there must be something behind it all and for Franken's father that something might as well be called God. The senator spoke proudly of his two children. He told the story of his young son who had received an award for being such a good, nice kid. When someone asked him why he was so good, the son answered, I think it has something to do with grandpa. With deep emotion in his voice, Senator Franken continued, to me, that's where God is. God is my dad's in me, and he's in my son." As I watched him and listened to him say those words on the video Nell had sent, my own thoughts about Jenna from that night staring at the light from my chalice began to crystallize and become complete. I'd been reading A House for Hope, a wonderful book by Reverend John Burens and Reverend Dr. Rebecca Ann Parker. I looked back at something Reverend Dr. Parker writes in the book. She says, The divine is not a despotic monarch ruling through coercion and threat, sanctifying violence. This is not an unchanging, eternal reality from which the imperfect can be condemned. This is not merely metaphor, but an actual presence, alive and afoot in the cosmos, an upholding and sheltering presence that receives and feels everything that happens with compassion and justice offering the world back to itself in every moment with a fresh impulse to manifest the values of beauty, peace, vitality, and liberation. Everlastingly emergent, alive, responsive, creative, at one with the chaotic, messy universe we live in. As I read that, my heart expanded and my thoughts grew more calm. Whether metaphor or actual presence, I thought, if there is God in the sacred beauty of our shared existence, ever changing with our experience of that unfathomably interconnected web, as Dr. Parker said, then God weeps with us, I thought. And that image was somehow comforting. God weeps for Jenna for Teresa and Tara, for all who knew and loved this amazing young woman, for the injury to the divine that her unexpected, untimely, and all too heartbreaking death had caused. And yet, I thought, if there is God in the sacred beauty of our shared existence, then there is the joy and light and love and laughter that was Jenna also. In our web of interconnectedness, there is the beauty of Jenna always in the beauty of shared existence. I don't know if this is merely metaphor or actual presence, as Dr. Parker says it is, and it doesn't take the sorrow away completely even now, but it does help me to remember to be grateful for life and the powerful interconnectedness we share, even lives that have been cut way too short, even at times when life seems senseless. Now every time I light my little chalice, I remember Jenna. I am reminded to try in my less than perfect way to carry forth her capacity to fill those around us with laughter and joy. And in that way, still there is Jenna and the experiences of her that those of us who loved her cannot help but carry forward into our continued shared existence. There is great divine joy in the beauty of always 
being interconnected with Jenna. Now let us pause for a moment and rise in body or spirit as we sing together verse 1 of hymn number 352, Find a Stillness. I wrote most of what I just shared with you six years ago just after Jenna's death. Until now, though, I had only shared it with a few people, and my own theology has changed since then. I got permission to update it to present tense and share it with you because I couldn't think of a stronger example in my own life when I had struggled with our topic for today, trying to make sense of what seems senseless. When something like that happens, when the horrific events like those we have witnessed in our country and our world lately occur, it can cause us to question our worldview, reconsider the way in which we find meaning and beauty, lose faith even in how we perceive that which is ultimate and provides structure and a sense of cohesiveness in our lives. Whether or not we have a concept of the divine, we can end up being forced to revise and reconstruct what I think could accurately be called our own personal theologies. And life can throw so much at us that can seem so senseless. The sudden earthquake, storm, or tsunami that rips through a populated area and takes so many lives. Terror attacks in Paris, San Bernardino, Istanbul, Dhaka, Baghdad, just to name a few. A sudden life-threatening diagnosis when we were not even known to be at risk for it. Police continuing to shoot and kill African Americans under highly questionable circumstances twice in just the last couple of weeks. Five police officers killed in Dallas in an apparent retaliation. A very disturbed young man who enters a nightclub in Orlando with an automatic weapon and takes out his own self-hatred on 49 innocent people. These are just a few examples. There are so many more. And some of these really are senseless in that they are at least partially random. Weather patterns or life's chance events, the creative unfolding of our universe can include events that both give us a perception of beauty and meaning and events that threaten to destroy that perception. Others of these, though, involve senseless loss, but in reality, they are the products of our own human systems that perpetuate violence, loss, and destruction. Laws, institutions, foreign policies that combine with an economic system of intense inequality and unfettered capitalism run amok that are threatening our planet and continuing to cre create the conditions that lead to extreme poverty, civil unrest and strife, oppression, war, racism, hatred, religious extremism, and acts of terrorism. These may seem senseless, but they are, in fact, not the products of random chance. They are human creations. No matter what the source, though, how do we make sense of all the senselessness? Is it even possible sometimes, or do we have to look away at times? I don't pretend to have all of the answers. I do think, though, that one of the things we have to do, especially in the face of great losses such as those we've been witnessing, is to allow ourselves to feel the emotions, to dwell in a worldview torn and shattered for a while. We have to process the grief and the heart sickness and the confusion, and we have to accept the anger that so often comes with it so that we can channel that anger in healthier directions that avoid more destruction like we saw with the police killings in Dallas this past week. We can channel them in directions that instead can help us create beneficial change, whether in our private lives or in the public sphere. Perhaps, for instance, we can channel our anger toward demanding sensible gun laws that will keep automatic weapons out of the hands of average citizens so that our country might one day no longer be the gun massacre capital of the world. Thank you. When events like the latest gun massacre or that 
unexpected diagnosis strike. Life can feel like the rug has been pulled out from under us at such times. We realize that we are fragile creatures and the events of our lives are unknown and uncertain and oftentimes outside of our control. Our agency then lies in how we respond to them. And I think that like I had to do after the senseless accident that took Jenna's brilliant life, sometimes, sometimes we have to reconstruct our worldview out of the rubble that is left of what we had believed before. And we do that both as an individual quest, examining and re-examining our own spirituality, and we also need a community to do it a community to lament with us, a community to celebrate the memory of that which we have lost, a community to hold us when we're in danger of falling into unyielding despair. Communally, we provide each other with the building blocks for creating a new, more nuanced and mature understanding of our world that none of us can find alone amidst the rubble that was left from how we made meaning and found beauty in the past. That's exactly the process that those of us who loved Jenna found that we needed. That's exactly how so many people are responding to the senselessness in Orlando, Baton Rouge, Dallas, and elsewhere. Muslim and LGBT communities that have reached out to one another and found themselves coming together in shared purposes even greater than each had known before. Environmental groups declaring solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. I find reason for hope in this. For thousands of years, Humankind has imagined goddesses and gods that brought all that is, including us, into existence. I'm beginning to think that maybe it works in the exact opposite way. Maybe when we reach out with love toward one another across our differences and even in the face of the tragic and inexplicable, together, Together we find new, more creative, and life-giving ways of constructing meaning and finding beauty in our world. Maybe we co-create the divine, bring blessings into our world that so badly needs it right now. May we make that so. Amen.